Hello and a very warm welcome back to the garden. It is August, it's a nice early morning and I thought it was perfect time to give you a tour of this no dig and permaculture inspired kitchen garden. So this year I thought I'd lost this garden because we had really dry weather, ran out of water for about a month and I'd nearly given up on it. But then I just thought, believe in the soil, but also to just create as much polyculture as possible. And so that's what feels really nice about this space. There's so many different things to look at. For example, I've got cosmos here. I've got some dill. I've got caraway. I've got uh, French beans and tomatoes. But there's so many different things happening. And there's so much productivity that I'm really happy with, with how it's turned out. I, I was definitely stressed at, earlier in the season. But now I just come here and I think... Oh, everything is saved and I can kind of enjoy the tail end of the season at least. One of the things that I'm trying out this year and I had some spare seedlings from the other garden is these dwarf edible lupins which are pretty top heavy now so they're flopping over but these have turned out really really well. They seem to enjoy the dry weather, thank goodness, so that, that's a benefit. But yeah, going to be harvesting these, drying them, processing them. And the most important thing is see whether they taste any good. So as you can see, there's just so many things happening. This is the end of the tender stem. Broccoli, just let it run to seed. Same with some of these leeks, just left them in so we could get the amazing leek flowers. In here, there's a lot of texture. We've got fennel, we've got beetroot behind, and then a bunch of ochre, which is looking very, very healthy. So I am... I'm really happy with how this is going, but it's kind of testament that if you let things just go and flower like these, it brings so much vibrancy to the garden. There's also some lettuce seed heads as well. So there's, there's so much flowers that it's really attracting all of the beneficial insects into the garden to help with pest control. And it's also good for the soul. One of the things that I've done is I've let a lot of the borage that was self-sown to just flower and it seems to be in its absolute prime at the moment, which is really nice because at the other garden, it's all gone over. So to come here and enjoy all of the bees around the borage is nice. Then we're getting a bunch of cauliflower out of this bed, um, which is very nice. So I'm gonna take that home for dinner. And then this here is a bunch of amaranth, which you can use the smaller leaves, but I'm growing it because of the beauty of the flowers, which are just starting to develop uh, this is Amaranthus cretanus. I want to talk quickly about onions. Two different stories here. We've got multi-sown onions. They're kind of, that's probably the biggest one here. Um, that was started at the same time as these sets, which are strewn. And the thing that I, I believe that a lot of gardeners don't understand about sets is that there's a time and a place to plant them. Very often you don't want to start off sets in autumn because it's going to have their second winter, which is why they run to seed the following spring. These are what I start in kind of late February, early March. And the, the difference of yield is uh, quite staggering. Now, of course, these aren't the same varieties, but if you find the right sets, onion sets, which for me is Struan and it's my default, I know every year it's going to do well and every year it does do well. So find your default varieties to ensure that you get good productivity. Because of the remoteness of this garden, it means that I can save seed without cross-pollination for some much harder to save seed varieties. For example, runner beans. These here are Keradigion runner beans. So they're runner bean that's local to this area, but they haven't been grown in Wales for about 20 years at least. So the, the pods are looking really nice and long. I'm not harvesting any because this is a seed crop but I'm very excited to, to see how these goes and then, sh and then share them with local gardeners. And then here is the hotbed, which is going still absolutely bonkers. I've got a spaghetti squash plant here with at the moment four spaghetti squash looking nice. And uh, yeah, we've had mushrooms popping up and around this all year. I'm really excited, say towards the end of autumn, to just see what the wood chip is looking like inside, probably full of mycelium, and that's gonna be a fantastic mulch to mulch around perennials. One of the crops that has done well with the lack of water is this corn, and some of it's looking really high, some is a little bit shorter, but it's starting to flower now. I can see a lot of little cobs starting to develop. Um, 
And I hope this year, some of you might know the disaster that happened last year with my corn. I'm going to be on it this year. I'm going to hire a full-time security guard to sit here day and night to protect it from those pesty rodents. This bed here has been quite a challenge this year, mainly with the parsnips that were sown and they just didn't appear for weeks and weeks. Now I know parsnips are quite slow to germinate, but it was at least six, maybe eight weeks before they made an appearance. I just thought it was a dud, but they finally have, and I'm hoping that they're gonna grow enough to at least warrant a bit of a crop. And then these beautiful flowers in front of me are Chinese garlic chives, and the flowers are so delicate, you can eat them, you can eat the leaves, they look a bit almost like a, a, a grass succulent type leaf. Really nice flavour and this is the perennial. So this is now in its second year and just grow it because it looks amazing and it tastes really good and that's the most important part. I just wanted to show this natural polyculture that developed. The only thing planted here were the marigolds or well the calendula. And there's also a bunch of coriander that's come through and dill. And I really love the colours between the, the white and the yellow and the orange. And then up here we've got some flowers and we're going to play a game. Guess the potato variety I'm growing in this bed that's a main crop. And I'll give you a clue, it begins with S and it's two words. So in this bed where there's now some mustard coming through, there were a bunch of field beans. Uh, these are multi-sown leeks. I've never actually done multi-sown leeks before, so I am very excited about that. And then of course this Australian tree cabbage with such beautiful leaves coming through. And, uh, and then this plant behind me did pretty well early in the year. It's honeyberry, so that really, really tasty, really, really sweet. This is just one plant and it does produce fruit. It's a misconception to think it doesn't. However, if there are two plants, it will yield a lot more due to pollination. So one thing to add here is another honeyberry plant just to massively increase production. So in the jungle here in the solar tunnel and the grapevine is laden, absolutely laden. My view as well, looking back towards who's just grapes on, on both sides. And I just, it creates this nice partial shade effect, which the tomatoes here were planted out a bit later, but they're coming on really well, productivity looking really good. But yeah, the highlight in this solar tunnel, absolutely are the grapes. So in this bed, I've gone a bit all out with leek flowers. The majority of these leeks are the variety Bandit, um, which hold really well and you can still harvest them in early May before they run to seed. So it's quite a good variety to grow for the Hungry Gap. And these have just been left to, to seed and they're starting to turn into the little seed heads at the top, which you can turn into leek capers. Sam has made a reel over on his Instagram and there's a link down below in the description so you can follow the exact recipe so you too can enjoy them. One of the permaculture principles is about valuing the marginal and about the edge effect. And very often the edges is where you have the highest productivity or the highest multitude of benefits. So we've got this amazing pair that is acting not just as a vertical way, the way that it's fan, fan trained onto this trellis. So we're not just making use of vertical space. It also is creating a microclimate within the garden because it's a bit of a sun trap and it's also protecting the garden from winds. And so we're stacking functions, but we don't have a walled garden per se. So think about what you could plant that are perennials this winter that can grow, that can produce, that can yield, that's around the perimeter of your garden, but offers extra benefits to create perhaps a more desirable microclimate within the boundary of your space. So here in the polycrop, it's turning into its usual jungle. And we've got a lot of different varieties of tomatoes that are coming through, which is really nice. I just wanted to also show this nice amaranth that are just self-seeded. And I thought, it's, well, it's actually growing in the pathway, and I thought I'd let it grow. And part of the magic, I think, of gardening is if you see a little seedling and it's growing somewhere that isn't too annoying, because I can squeeze past it, let it grow, see how it does, and uh, very often it turns into one of your favourite elements within a space. Last year, I filmed a garden tour during 
every, basically every month of the growing season. So watch this video to compare last August garden tour to this. Let me know which one you prefer the most.